thanks for doing this on such last minute notice. Likewise. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Well, I'm excited. Do you have any Thanksgiving plans? I'm just here in Flag because I leave for Patagonia on Saturday, so I can't go home, then come back, and then leave again. So I'm just going to stay till I leave. Oh, well, on the one hand, that's a little sad, but on the other hand, you're going to Patagonia. Yeah, it's an okay trade off. Yeah. <laughs> My family. Will I've understand. always wanted to go. That's like a bucket list spot for me. It's so cool. It doesn't look like. What are you going to be doing else. there? I'm doing El Cruce with Saucony. Um, it's like a three day stage race, but I won't really oh, be wow. racing. I'll just be kind of like running because I'm not really to a point where I can race yet. Yeah. I do want to talk about that a little bit, sure. but, um, yeah, I'm just super excited. You're here on such last minute notice. Uh, so no Turkey trot for you this year, right? No, I'll do my own <laughs> Turkey trot probably with people in Flagstaff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you just mentioned it, but I want to talk a little bit more about this. I think all your fans are, uh, concerned, uh, rightfully so. And, and they want you to be healthy and well, because you're an absolute force to be reckoned with on the course out there. Uh, and I just learned on your Instagram account that you maybe have an autoimmune disease. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's been quite the interesting last five months of experiencing things and kind of going through like a medical journey. Um, so yeah, it's been a roller coaster so far. And right now they think it's a form of vasculitis, which is an autoimmune disease. Um, there's like a couple different versions of it that they're still like, which one could it be? And I'm learning that autoimmune diseases are really tricky things that are like shape shifters and you don't always know what's going on. So that doesn't help the diagnosis either. No, that sounds so frustrating, especially because it's essentially your body getting upset with your own body yeah. and, <laughs> and targeting it in some kind of way. Yeah. It's like self-destruction. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Does that, is that re uh, sorry, let me start over. Is that the reason why you're not racing in Patagonia in the coming weeks? Yeah. I just started a treatment plan and I think it's working, which is great, but we're still like, is running 60 miles over three days, like as fast as I can really the best idea for me right now. Probably not. So I'll just. Well, when you put it like that. <laughs> I'm just going to go and treat it as like three fun long runs um, with some friends. And then hopefully the body is. That's okay. Hopefully that's enough to keep it calm. It sounds like intensity is, is the thing that could either set it off or not be great for your recovery, but just a lot of volume is okay. Yeah, we're going to find out. Um, it's basically like inflammation is kind of at the root of the disease. So kind of keeping inflammation under control and then figuring out what causes me to become inflamed, whether that's volume or intensity or food. Um, some food stuff has come up too. So yeah, I think it's like a big puzzle. A big puzzle. I think the last podcast we recorded together, we were talking about another big puzzle that you were trying to solve, which was just this long-term injury last year that you might've been dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, so at least you're no stranger to big puzzles in the running world. Yes. And hopefully that gives you some good experience to solve this one. Yeah. And actually now we're thinking that that still unsolved injury is related now to the autoimmune disease, which in a way is nice because it makes me feel like I'm less crazy for not being able to figure the injury out. Um, but it just means this has been going on longer than we kind of thought at first. Yeah. Um, it's, it's so obvious that the running community wants you to be healthy and to race because you're, I think one of the most exciting racers out in the community, you're someone who can go run a three day, 100 kilometer stage race, but then also do like a four mile vertical kilometer race up at high altitude in the mountains. So your range is just really awesome to behold. Um, and so I, I want to talk about the, the vertical kilometer, because I think that is such just a wild event <laughs> that most runners don't really have too much experience with. So just understanding the full contours of that kind of a race uh, is going to be really interesting. But let's start super broad first. I'd just love to know, like, how do you think of yourself as a runner? Because you, on the one hand, are doing ultra marathons, 
But on the other hand, you're doing like middle distance races. Mm -hmm. So there's like the, the breath is simply incredible. Is your training all over the place? (laughs) Like, how do you, how do you train for all these races? Yeah, I guess. So for this ultra ultra marathon, um, it's broken up into 20 mile days. So I hesitate to call it a true ultra. I think the ultra people would be like, no. Um, But yeah, I think for my training in general, because other than this race, all my races are like up to like 75 minutes, I would say. Um, So I basically train all year round. Like I'm trying to just get really fit for a 10K on the track or a half marathon on the road. And then that just kind of gets me fit enough to tackle pretty much anything. If we're doing like steeplechase or 5K on the track, then it gets a little bit more specific in maybe a couple weeks leading up to the race. But even with Worlds in June, I did two trail workouts before the World Championships. So I didn't really get that specific for that either. I think it just kind of that hour mark, threshold, lots of threshold um, is kind of the sweet spot for having the breadth and be able to jump into lots of different races. Yeah. It just seems like you've, you kind of stay in the middle and then that allows you to either drop down or go up in distance. So you're never very far away from wherever you need to be. You're always pretty close. Yeah, I think that, that seems to be a effective strategy. Yeah. Yeah. I think we like touch different speed zones like once a week at least. So then if we're like, oh, we want to do 5K, it's not like I haven't done something close to 5K pace work like months away. It was like last week we probably touched it. So it's nice. So recently, has your training been more low intensity, staying away from some of the harder workouts? Um, And maybe does that mean you're still doing some threshold work too? Yeah, I'm pretty much, um, it's been about a month of being able to, be at about 55 miles a week, which is like 75%, 70% of normal for me of volume. And then with intensity, we're still at about one workout a week, um, one kind of long run, not as long as I would like, but from the last four months, it's definitely long because the four months before that, I really wasn't running at all. So it's kind of building back from scratch. And yeah, the intensity is actually kind of they're like short and sweet fart like workouts, but they're like one minute on one minute off. So they are quite fast. And David, my coach likes to start builds with like touching some speed work first before jumping into a big block of threshold to make sure mechanically you're like efficient and to make sure like then your threshold pace isn't your top end. So it doesn't feel like you're sprinting for threshold because you've done the speed work. So we're kind of in that like transition zone right now. Yeah. And I think that's a, an interesting way to go about things and sort of a nonlinear periodization approach. So for our listeners, I, I love this because what you're doing is you're essentially creating a foundation for the threshold work mm-hmm. from the other direction. Yeah. A lot of people think you create a foundation with just easy running. You can create a foundation too with speed work. And by doing a little bit of speed, you're you're really creating that that foundation of good mechanics and uh, some, you know, extra fitness from the speed work that really makes those threshold workouts just a lot easier. And like you said, you want to ensure that your threshold pace isn't your top end pace, (laughs) that the fastest you've run in a long time. (laughs) Let's talk about the vertical kilometer. This is such a, a crazy event. Uh, I'm absolutely fascinated by it. And I've read you, uh, describing it as running an 800 meter race for 40 minutes. Yeah. Uh, I've got to be honest, you're not really selling it for me too well right there. It sounds like maybe the worst experience ever. I was going to ask, have you done one? <laughs> no way. Are you going to do one? I feel like if, if Grayson Murphy is challenging me to a vertical kilometer, I have to. It's a, yeah, you should experience it once at least. It's like one of those things. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> I will think about it, Grayson. Is, is there one here in Colorado? I live in Denver. Um... I think that at the the Red Bull Vail Games in the spring, there's usually like a similar uphill race or you could do Pikes Peak, but that's like a half marathon all uphill. So that's not quite the same, but I'm sure it hurts just as bad. <laughs> 
Yeah, that that's one I've actually looked into, but the vertical kilometer seems to be way more intense than than the half up Pikes Peak. Yeah. <laughs> So what exactly is a vertical kilometer race? It's not a kilometer, is it? No, but well, you're climbing a kilometer invert. Straight up, uh-huh. right? But the distance of the race is usually around 5K. Um, they try and get it to be like the shortest path that you can accomplish 1,000 feet invert or 1,000 meters invert, which is about 3,000 feet for people listening. Yeah, a thousand meters, a kilometer, three thousand feet, roughly. Um, so we're talking about maybe eight hundred feet of gain per mile, um, or or even a little bit more, depending on the exact distance of, yeah. of the race. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've had the one at Worlds was interesting in that there was kind of like a flat mile in the middle. So although it was four miles that mile didn't have vert in it. So it was basically the other three had a thousand feet each. Wow. Does that completely change your approach to the race? I I imagine as soon as everyone hits the flat, you're like, you're running 420 pace or something, right? Well, at that point you've been climbing for over 30 minutes. So you're like lactic (laughs) up to your eyeballs. So it's like pretty hard to get it turning over. And I think that was kind of a crucial like crux point of the race where if you couldn't get to that point and be able to like flush the lactic and then get running again you were kind of like game over because then you had another mile with another thousand feet of vert which was probably the worst mile after that um so it's kind of like riding that line to get to that point where you could still run and then have enough in the tank for one more mile of climbing yeah, I, I think I saw one of your Instagram reels of you finishing one of these vertical kilometer races and you were like, my my right arm isn't working. You used an audio overlay from the office of, um, I'm not an office fan. I, I forget the guy's uh, name, um, but when he's like, do I like doing this? No. Do I do it anyways? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Do I know why? No. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That's pretty much the thoughts going through my head when I do a VK. Yeah. And it's also very uh, interesting to watch you cross the finish line because it's almost unlike any other race where there's like a finishing kick. I'm sure you're trying to run as fast as you can, but it almost looks like you just shuffle across the line. All the you know energy is completely drained from your face. You know, you've only been running for about 40 minutes, if that, but it, it seems to me like you just pour every every gram of carbohydrate from your body, every ounce of energy, you know, every possible muscle contraction that you could have had is just done at the end. And it seems so intense. Yep. Can, can confirm very intense. I think I, the worst I've ever felt at the end of any race is in a VK. It's worse than track. It's worse than road, worse than other mountain races. Um, yeah. Cause really your limiter is your aerobic system because you're not on the track, like if you're trying to run a 5K, um, if I can't run 450 pace because my body just can't move that quickly, then my aerobic system is probably fine. But on the VK, some of my miles, I think I had a 15 minute mile. So you're not moving quickly, but you're just really, it's your engine and how like high can you rev it and then keep it there for as long as you can. Um, so you really like, get to like the true nitty gritty of your aerobic capacity as opposed to like having your biomechanical system limit you. Yeah. And this seems to be such a good combination of both like the threshold type of fitness, but also you've got to be able to deliver maximum oxygen through VO2 max. Mm-hmm. And I've also heard you in an interview say that like, you don't actually like VO2 max oriented workouts. It's like the <laughs> least favorite. Yeah. It looks like you've You've got like the fear of God in your eyes right now. When I mentioned <laughs> VO2 max, how does someone get so good at races like this? If you don't like VO2 max workouts. Yeah. I think my coach has the same question too. Um, he puts that <laughs> on the schedule. I'm like, oh man, like how many of these do I have to do before we can go back to threshold? Um, I don't know. I kind of look at, it does feel like a VO2 max test, the VK. And I think when I go into the race, you just kind of have to go into it with like a different mindset than any other race that 
it's not really about moves. Um, you just kind of have to run your own race because you're running so hard but so slowly that you can't really make – you might get to make one move on someone during that race. But other than that, you're kind of just like – mentally how well can I tolerate this pain and for how long so it's kind of more of a mental thing to me yeah when when you do start doing some of those harder workouts in prep for such an intense event like this what do those look like I'm, I'm just very curious you know at the absolute top of the sport what kind of vo2 max workouts are you doing for a vertical kilometer race I only did one like trail version before worlds and um, there's a peak called Grander Peak in Salt Lake. So I was home right before world. So we just decided to just see how fast I could run to the top. Cause it's a, it approximates a VK. Um, so that was that workout and it was based, yeah, just kind of run as fast as you can to the top. And then if we're doing like flat VO2 max stuff, it's like three minute intervals, um, three to four minute and just pretty fast, faster than 5k. I would say, or right at 5k pace, goal pace. So. Is, is that about a kilometer for you? Three minutes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we usually go by time because if I'm on the road, I don't have a wheel and I don't love like wheeling things out to measure a K. So I'll just approximate three minutes is about a K. But yeah, it's pretty fast. And then longer break probably than if we were doing threshold stuff. Um, and then like hill sprints, like 30 to 60 second hill sprints, I think at the end have been pretty common too in those workouts. Okay. So you'll do some VO2 max work and then end it with a series of relatively short, but very fast hill reps. Mm -hmm. Or if we're flat, I'll do flat too, but then that's like getting into mile pace stuff. Oh, okay. Wow. So very, very fast. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what's the thinking behind say doing a series of hill reps after a series of VO2 max oriented repetitions? Is it, is it muscle fiber recruitment? Is it, you know, revving just like max heart rate? Like what are you actually trying to focus on? And I'm sure it's not one thing. It's probably a couple. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I definitely need to double check with David, but I think it's more mostly for the muscle fiber recruitment and like can you run fast now after you're tired um, and get the power out too? Because the VO2 max, well, the BK is, it's a power event too, even though it's like a 50 minute race, which is kind of strange to think about, but you still need a lot of power when you're climbing. So I think kind of to that end for the hill sprints. Probably comes in handy when you hit that how a uh, flat stretch in the race where okay i am absolutely spent but can i recruit those fibers get some more power out of my legs start flushing everything out before we do it again <laughs> before you do it all over again so you, yeah you're simulating a lot of what you're going to experience in the race in training um it sounds like the the massive amount of threshold work you do is is arguably more important because that's really your engine with the vo2 max work is like you know not how big your engine is but more like how efficient is that engine yeah yeah and i think that for whatever reason i respond better to threshold work than vo2 max work and that's kind of i think why i also don't particularly like it because it doesn't feel good to me and i don't Sometimes I get like overly inflamed from it for no reason at all, um, which we still have yet to figure out. But the threshold work I seem to be able to handle and then it somehow just translates really well to having like building a bigger engine block. So then when you're like getting to those smaller gears in races, faster gears, um, it works somehow. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I, I've always thought that threshold work, you know, around lactate threshold, you know, if you're well-trained, it's probably about your one hour race pace mm -hmm. is probably some of the best training that runners can do when they start doing faster workouts. Cause it's like the gift that keeps on giving, yeah. you know, it is, it is just building a bigger and bigger engine, the more and more you do it. Mm -hmm. And, and you probably sort of hit the lottery here with being someone who not only has an incredible amount of talent and, and work ethic, but you're also someone who responds really well 
to the type of workout that's probably the most beneficial for endurance runners. So you're in that like amazing sweet spot, which then lets you have the incredible range that you do have. I think, yeah, that must be it. And I think that's why training for about a 10 K to half marathon all the time seems to work really well, at least for now. I think if I get into when I get into like the marathon longer stuff, um, that will need to be adjusted a little bit, but for now I think it works out really well. So the VO2 max is really like icing on the cake. You don't even do too many of those workouts, even as you're getting ready for, you know, a, a VO2 max suffer fest. Yep. Yeah. I, I think my coach too knows, like I can push myself really hard. Like I've told him a lot of times I can like black out on hill workouts, um, pretty frequently. So he doesn't give them to me often. Cause I think he knows we it's like higher risk than reward at this point. And Maybe it's good once before the race to just kind of feel that suffer fest feeling, but we're not going to get too much out of it if we do a bunch of those workouts. That's some good coaching right there. And you mentioned David is your coach, yeah. David Roche. Mm -hmm. um, I've had David on the podcast a, a bunch of times, I think once last year to talk for an hour all about long runs. And I think <laughs> if anyone wants to really geek out yeah. about long runs, that is an amazing episode because David definitely knows his stuff. He does, yeah. Um, so, so Grayson, I'm, I'm very encouraged by all of this because I, I think if one of the best runners in the world doesn't have to do an extraordinary amount of brutally hard VO2 max workouts, that probably means the rest of us don't have to as well. <laughs> now, of course, there's some variability here, but one thing I've noticed in the running community is that some people really like to suffer and some people love to just do hard workouts. And that may actually not be the best strategy long-term to get the most out of yourself because it's, it's not really building your capacity. Whereas those threshold workouts are building your capacity. Um, when you think VO two max workouts and you know, the, not the average runner or the, the recreational runner, how much of that do you think we need? Is it, is it something where it's just a little sprinkling on the top of the cake? Uh, is it once a week? Is it less than that? Give us your thoughts on that. Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. I think if you're doing strides like two or three times a week, um, you could, and I guess it depends on what your race goals are too. Because if you're trying to run like a 3K or a 5K on the track, you might need a little bit more than someone trying to run even a 10K or half marathon. Um, but yeah, I think every couple of weeks, if you can touch it, and then you're still touching the speed with the strides so that you're not like totally out of touch with that biomechanically then when you do have those workouts it's like okay we're just like revving the engine a little bit but not overdoing it and especially if you feel like your base is underdeveloped and like maybe your threshold needs more work than the vo2 max then i would say yeah only every couple of weeks would you need to do a vo2 max workout it's almost like this is like a a dumbbell a dumbbell scenario here where a lot of your effort is on the endurance side of things with threshold work. A lot of your effort is on the other side of the spectrum, just speed work mm -hmm. with strides or, or, you know, some of those 30 second yeah. hill strides, something like that. And then a little bit of your work is in the middle mm -hmm. with this VO2 max oriented work. Exactly. Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good distribution. And I've definitely probably plagiarized that from David, but I really think he's on to something with that. And um, yeah, I think most people, it's like the 80, 20 kind of training thing where it should mostly, most of the time be like pretty easy. Um, and then you can sprinkle in those like really hard things once in a while. Yeah. And this is probably a more important principle for a beginner or an intermediate runner to follow, because I, th I think the really hard VO2 max oriented work, the, the things that come in the middle of that speed spectrum when you're running 3K pace, 5K pace, you know, those are really hard efforts, especially if you're running longer repetitions at them. Mm -hmm. Those should be done sparingly, like you said, if you don't have a well-developed base. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it, you have to be careful too. Like if your threshold pace and then your VO2 max pace are starting to get close to each other, um, you probably need to do more threshold work. But, and it's kind of, kind of, kind of counterintuitive because you think, well, wouldn't I want to train like the higher end 
but you want your threshold because that's like your first zone almost to be like huge like a pyramid and then it builds up and yeah if you're starting to get the two like overlapping you've got problems <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah the the faster your threshold pace is the better distance runner you're going to be you know I, and i think if i were to know any one physiological metric for a runner to predict a race performance it would probably be what pace can they run at lactate threshold, mm -hmm. that to me is probably the best indication of where they're going to be at. You know, it's not some running economy score. It's not whatever their VO2 max score is, because those things aren't necessarily really tied to how well you can perform in a race situation, but your threshold pace sure is. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, it's like a feeling too, because I think if you're able to identify like what threshold feels like, that puts you in a lot better spot. Because then in the race, you know, like, okay, I can keep running this pace for about an hour. Like I should be able to get an, about an hour out of this pace. Um, and I think some people run threshold too fast thinking this is threshold, but then get to the race and they're like, why can't I run my threshold pace? So I think that's part of it too, is like knowing mentally what that feeling feels like so that you can put it into practice in a race situation. That reminds me of sort of a, an off base question here. I, I think you are a hundred percent right. That gets challenging though, when you are always relying on your heart rate monitor and your watch and some algorithmic score that your watch is giving you and all this kind of stuff. How do you find the balance between running a certain pace or falling within the same heart rate zone that you want to be at versus just feeling how you feel and using that as your data to inform your pace? Yeah, I guess like, so I've never done lactate threshold testing, actually, um, which I would love to do because I would love to know. But uh, I've always gone by feel. So it's taken some practice of figuring out what that feels like to me. But one of my coaches used to tell me it was it should feel comfortably uncomfortable. It's kind of like you're riding a knife's edge and it's a workout. So it's not going to feel like an easy run. So you shouldn't expect it to, it should feel uncomfortable, but in a way that you're like, okay, well, I can just keep doing this. Like it's tolerable. Um, kind of like putting your hand on a hot stove where it's hot, but if you can just kind of like relax, you're fine. Um, it shouldn't be like burning you right away either. Doesn't threshold get easier the more you do it, not because you're getting into better shape, but more because you're learning how to just sit with that uncomfortable feeling. Because I remember first doing threshold workouts, you know, years into my running career in high school. And at the time I had no experience with them. Mm -hmm. I was either running easy or very hard. Yeah. And I had no idea like how to be moderately uncomfortable for an extended period of time. And it took a couple years of just religiously doing these workouts for me to get comfortable with them. That makes sense. It's kind of like in my head, I think of it kind of like a, a meditation practice where you're just kind of like getting comfortable being uncomfortable or breathing through it, but knowing that like, oh, it's actually not that bad if you can just relax into it. That reminds me of my favorite college workout. And most people are going to think I'm a complete sociopath, <laughs> but eight kilometer threshold run on the track. That's a long, long 20 minute. laps, <laughs> 20 laps, just like meditation. You are just clicking off those laps and just living in your own head, mm -hmm. sitting with that discomfort. And I loved that workout, but it is also a, a little bit of a, a, a masochistic workout. Yeah. It sounds like a nice brain massage though for your, with the laps. Yeah. And, and in a way, I think it's one of the most effective ways to build mental toughness and just a sense of calm when you're under pressure, when you're uncomfortable, you know, for, for like a half marathoner or a 10,000 meter runner. Again, one of the best, I think, psychological pieces of the training is just sitting in that threshold ish effort zone and being okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. Not trying like getting antsy and trying to go faster. Um, or not slowing down because you think you won't make it. It's just kind of like trusting that it's okay to be in this comfortably uncomfortable zone. What do your threshold workouts look like? Are they some of the, just the classic 20 to 30 minutes, or do you like to get fancy, do some more complex 
tempo kind of runs? How do you like to do things? Yeah, so I actually, the last, even in college, the longest like single bout of threshold I'll do is 12 minutes maybe at the most. Um, but then okay. like repeats of that in college, it was like three by eight minutes was like a staple for us. Um, we didn't ever do like long continuous tempos. And then that kind of has carried through. David is very similar to my college coach in that. And yeah, I think for us, 10 minutes is usually the longest bout I'll do. And then maybe just like three or four of those at a time. What kind of recovery does that include? Usually it's active recovery, so jogging, and I don't know, for 10 minutes, maybe two or three minutes of recovery in between. Now, are, are you are you masochistic like me and like to do these on the track, or you like to do them out on the road or trail? I like the road. Um, yeah, I really don't do much trail workout stuff. Like, I'll do one or two before a trail race, but yeah, everything on the road is nice. Um, for some reason, I just do a lot better when I can see far away and like no I just have to get to that point instead of like laps on the track okay now you are a very very good track athlete though and and I also remember you saying in an interview correct me if I'm wrong that you don't actually like the track no not really <laughs> it's like okay. the VK <laughs> it's like the VK yeah. um so I rarely meet other steeplechasers I I did the steeplechase when I was in college um absolutely loved it kind of a crazy you know it, it's it's like the vk of the track world yeah. like this kind of weird event most people don't do it most people look at it like it's this alien event that only crazy people do uh, but for me it was just a, a, a rough and tumble wild adventure uh are, are we ever going to see you again in a steeplechase i don't know at this point i would say probably not but you never know i feel like my career has taken plenty of turns out of left field, so wouldn't say never. But yeah, I think after the trials, I was like pretty happy with that chapter of my career and like pretty walking away, closing it, I was okay with. So I think, yeah, I like the road and the trail a lot more. Well, you teased a marathon at some point in the future. Is that where you're thinking your your racing career is going to go to? Yeah, I did. I qualified for the Olympic trials with the half marathon this spring, but now with the health stuff, I'm probably not going to do trials just because I don't want to put that pressure on myself quite yet. And if I'm going to show up to a marathon start line, I want to like show up ready to kick butt. And um, I just, yeah, I don't think I'm quite ready to be there yet. So would love to debut at like a real marathon race, like existing marathon race. That's not the trials maybe next year, but we will see how the health stuff evolves. Yeah, that's really exciting. And it's also, I think, the general trend among professional runners is to sort of go up in distance mm -hmm. over time. I'd love your thoughts on that general trend, because I, on the one hand, think it is the most developmentally appropriate thing to do as your career gets developed, as you know, you've sort of taken advantage of your speed in your 20s. And then at some point in your 30s, you're like, well, I'm never going to run the same 800 meter time or 1500 time that I did when I was 25 years old. Um, but I can still run 60, 70, 80 miles a week and build all this amazing endurance. So for me, it makes total sense. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on sort of why that trend is is right for you. Yeah, I think probably along those lines. Um, and I am not a high mileage runner, so I think like building up to a point where I feel like, okay, I've had enough lifetime miles now that I can move into the marathon and feel like my engine's big enough, my base is big enough to be able to carry me through this event. Um, I could see the argument like maybe if you have been higher mileage, younger or earlier on in your career, maybe you'd want to move into that earlier. But yeah, for me, it's been a training age situation um because yeah I'm only eight years into running like full-on um my full running career including college so I think that's kind of like why I've waited and there's a lot of other events too that you want to get good at and like the 5k and the 10k and I know it's possible to be fast at all three at the same time but 
I think, yeah, like you said, it's easier when you've got 25-year-old speed to just jump into a 5K than it is maybe when you're a little bit older. I know. I pine for the days of having my 25-year-old hormonal profile, (laughs) too. (laughs) Especially, I think women, too, we've definitely seen, like, as you age, you get a lot better in the endurance events. And um, actually, on David's last podcast, they were talking about your type 1 muscles fibers tend to be more dominant the older you get as well and your type 2 kind of start to go away so that makes it even more efficient for like endurance events as you get older so it kind of makes sense you said something that was really interesting to me grace and you said lifetime miles Mm -hmm. i think every runner is familiar with the concept of your weekly mileage I love I love advising runners to think about monthly mileage because it's just a longer term way of thinking about volume. I think it's a little bit safer. Mm-hmm. You have taken it to this <laughs> next level of thinking about lifetime miles. That I think is an interesting way of thinking about just your total workload over a really long period of time. Do you do you track your mileage? annually lifetime or are you going that big picture and, and and tracking that yeah i do track it annually actually in my training logs i have a annual tracker and monthly so i like to do that every year to see like what was my monthly average this year and then the total for the year and then i can look back and see year by year how did that increase and it has like every year since i've started running slowly has increased I don't have a total number of lifetime miles though, which might be a fun thing to go add up. Yeah. I don't, I don't think I do either. I mean, I have like spreadsheets and training logs going back to 1998 when I started running as a freshman in high school. (laughs) Uh, I've got a couple years on you, but it it would be really interesting to to go back and and add up all the miles. Cause I think some of my peak years were 3,100, maybe 3,200 miles. Um, you know, maybe around 55, 60 miles a week average. Mm-hmm. But when you start stacking year after year after year like that, that's when the massive improvements come yeah. and just, you know, y- you'll have a breakthrough because mm-hmm. it's it's one thing to have a high mileage week. Yeah. It's another thing to have a high mileage month. But my God, if you can have a high mileage year, now we're talking. Uh-huh. And if you can continue slowly, like edging it up, it just seems like that helps. But I think the slow part is key too. Like, no huge jumps year over year because that's unsustainable. Yes, 100%. Well, Grayson, uh, I'm, I'm so glad we were able to get you on the podcast last minute right before Thanksgiving. Uh, I really hope your your health is is continues to get better and better and you have such an amazing time in Patagonia in a couple of weeks. That is going to be such an experience. I hope you put a lot of like trail porn up on your Instagram account. <laughs> I will. I'm going to need that. Okay. Don't worry. <laughs> Cause it's, it's arguably one of the most beautiful places on the planet. So we, we've, you've got to get uh, someone to take some amazing photos oh, yeah. of yourself running out there. I will. My sister's actually coming with, um, with Saucony to be on the media team and take photos. So it'll be fun amazing. to have her there, but she'll get some good pics. I'm sure. That's so cool. Well, This was really fun. Uh, Congrats on all your success this year, earlier this year. Uh, I know you're going to figure out this autoimmune issue and come roaring back to the race course next year when you're ready. Uh, Congrats again on your updated training log and planner that you have available. Uh, Do you want to talk about that for a second? Sure. Yeah, it's the sixth edition. So really cool to have been doing this for six years, well, five and a half, which seems just crazy. Um, But yeah, we've got a new cover. And like I said, there's habit trackers for the monthly and yearly mileage stuff. I've also been doing hours, which if you're looking for another interesting metric, start looking at the hours, um, month and year, but yeah. Um, training log and daily planner all in one with mental health stuff. There's race day, uh, worksheets for goal setting. So it's what I do for my races. So I wanted to share that with people and hopefully it helps some people out there. And we're having a Black Friday sale in case this comes out before Black Friday. Ooh, probably not. But nevertheless, it's still a great planner. I actually own a copy myself. um, And and you use it yourself too, right? Mm -hmm. Every year. Yeah. Well, if it's good enough for Grayson Murphy, it's good enough for anybody. (laughs) I'll send you a new one for the next year. Oh, thank you. 
and and they can get it at your website, right? Grayson-Grayson.com. I will include a link to that in the show notes for this episode on strength running. Grayson, thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. It was great to catch up.